Now, after going deep into Russia, Ukraine, and some of the inner inner workings, and and if I didn't make it clear, the the Ukraine did deliver all of the nuclear missiles back to Russia in 1996, so that did come to fruition, and they do not own or possess those nuclear weapons, and that also I, I think comes to some of the hesitancy that other countries have in terms of giving up either their drive to obtain them or the fact that they have them and denuclearizing because you're seeing what happens if you don't have some of that mutual destruction um, in it. But if you think about the Ukraine at the time, there it's it was still raw from Chernobyl and they didn't want the responsibility at this point. And there was also a lot of Russian influence still within the, within the government, which enabled them to, again, move this through. But turning to the US investor, so the US retail investor. Now, I, I think this is interesting because the, there was always a view of the Fed put where if everybody would always buy the dip, you know, institutional investors, because the Fed would always had your back. There was always a backstop. And now is it the retail put where U.S. retail investors are, are trained and go, go back through the last decade, you have always been rewarded for buying the dip. There has never been a point in time where if you bought the dip, you were penalized. If you buy the dip, you, uh, you win 10 out of 10 times over the last decade. And that has emboldened a lot of investors, especially on the, excuse me, especially on the retail side, which is why anytime you get a down move, you can expect to see a huge response. Now, the largest retail flows on record was the Omicron dip. So because they're essentially saying the, the Fed's hawkish, whatever, it doesn't matter. I'm buying this debt because where else am I going to put my money? And I think this is very interesting because they're also using margin. And how sophisticated are they? You know, is this something where now that we have not so much institutional investors coming in, but retail investors coming in and buying the dip, that we could get a, uh, a margin call. We could get some additional pressure. And this is this the top? And we start to see these massive swings. And we've seen the swings. You know, the VIX uh, is obviously down now, but we had some large 1% moves up and down as there was competition with, are, are we going to see some of these adjustments? And now, We've had a steady move back up, but I think this is going to be interesting to see if there's, if there's pain, and I mean real pain, do you get retail investors coming in or do we get margin calls accelerating this down move? So that, but then when you look at investors, investors poured $10 billion into U.S. equity funds in the week ending December 1st. To give you an idea of just how much where there was a lot of money coming in to pick up some of this, but... Where's, what's the Fed going to do? You know, the Fed fund futures implied number of rate hikes in 2022. So as of to, uh, December 3rd, there's still a belief that we're going to have close to three, if not a guaranteed two, rate hikes in 2022. So d does that become a bigger issue? Do we start to see investors, and, and by investors, I mean institutional guys saying, look, we've had a good run. This will slow things down. And if they start selling... Are, are, do, do retail investors still have any ammo? Are there any quivers left in, in, uh, to, to deploy? Or would that beget more selling and put some pressure? This is something I, I'm not saying I know. But again, these are things that are going to be interesting. And that's going to be kind of that, that push me, pull me aspect of who gives way first? Is it the institutional investor that drives the retail investor to sell? Or is it the retail investor that, that continues to say lock in profits or just sell in general because they have to go to back to work? And then you start to see some of these selling pressures. But when you look at the yield curve, so typically when you get a flat lining, and that's the flatness of the yield curve has never been observed outside of actual rate hikes. So this is a as the curve flattens, you're essentially getting almost a guarantee that the bond market is indicating a rate hike is likely, which I think is not something that to be argued. The question is going to be how many? Is it one, two, or three? I would err on the side of three, but that's because I think inflation is going to be uh, sticky. You're going to see a lot of that driving up, and that will keep people very active.
Uh, that will keep, again, the Fed trying to, again, taper a bit sooner. Now, Powell went a little bit softer than his more hawkish stance, but that's going to become, I think, a bigger issue overall and few people with inflation experience. This, I think, is a key note. And, and I've talked about this, you know, when I when I relayed the story about my, me talking with my father about the last time he was concerned about inflation, which he said was 1982. Now, I was born in 1984. So what is my experience, real experience with inflation? And it's, I mean, I have been through some rate, rate raising cycles, but I have studied inflation um, aggressively. I, I, I believe I have educated myself to the best of my abilities, but have I really experienced what, what happened in the 70s and 80s? No. And that's where I think you're going to see some of this, and it's going to be very interesting to see how this gets deployed as the retail investor and the institutional investor, because the institutional investor doesn't have experience with inflation of what we're seeing. And I think that's going to be very interesting. But what are we seeing? So the PC price index month over month, you're just seeing the pressure and what I keep talking about of um, sticky versus flexible, where when you look at services, when you look at non-durable goods, durable goods, the pricing remains elevated and the contribution continues to drive higher. And those core PCE moves month over month continue to crop up. And now it's not that we're, we expect the pace to slow, especially in, 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 um, in, at the end of November, but definitely in December. November, we'll still see some positive. We'll get that information and talk about it on Friday. But there's going to be this pressure that's going to kick back up in Q2 of 2022, keeping things fairly elevated. And then when you look at the top five component contributors on an absolute level, you have uh, you know, you, you have uh, food and beverage. We have uh, motor vehicles, housing gasoline and other energies. You know, some of these things are going to remain elevated, especially coming back to Russia, Ukraine, and the underlying fear factor that's going to come into natural gas and these prices, because we do import from Europe. We know that is going to become an issue. We imported three diesel cargos from Russia. There's some of these underlying factors, which again is keeping us bid, especially on the motor vehicle and parts, which accelerated again in November. So then when you look at year over year, here's that steady walk up. Now, we think it's, it, it ebbs and the pace slows, as we've been saying, but still remains on an upward trajectory, putting that underlying pressure. And, and how, do, does, how does the real retail investor and institutional investor really start to react? And that's when we start looking at where the contribution is and the remaining contribu uh, contributors continues to take a bigger share, which is why Powell is now more concerned because it's less flexible, reopening, and it's much stickier now. You're seeing it in wages. You're seeing it in rents. Now, these are things that don't just go away, which again is keeping people on their toes. And that's why when we look again, and I know it's a repeat from before, but we look at the, re the retail investor and how aggressively they've been involved in, the buying, in buying the dip in the last two years of trading, how much of that goes away. And when you look at it, retail investors not yet disturbed by recent market weakness. When Om Omicron caused volatility to spike, retail net stock purchases spiked to the highest on record last week. But what has moved? And, and soon when you start looking at, when you look at the, part, the, the participation rate fairly flat, that has to increase in order to dampen wage and wage pressure. And this comes down to, well, when these individuals start to sell or, or go back, back from away from day trading back to the job, you know, that is the only real way we could see wage pressure start to slow. But wage pressure remains, and that's keeping, again, that stickiness in the inflationary factors, which is why we're getting this battle of how much is the Fed going to raise rates and how fast will they taper to try to get in front of what is being now very clear, the stickiness behind the inflationary move. And that's when you start looking at the U.S. long-term index, macro index, with ISM manufacturing in the business cycle. This is also showing that we're much later in the business cycle 
because we're getting towards that late stage, given the amount of liquidity, given the amount of support that has come into the system, especially from the Fed. So then when you start looking at, well, what is what's happening on the industry, on, on, on the business side, U.S. consumer prices rose 6.2% in the 12 months through October, the most since 1990. The new data on corporate earnings suggests business can comfortably pass on all its higher costs, which means there may be more inflationary pressure to come. If profits are strong, there's going to be continued demand for workers, and in a tight labor market, there's going to be continued upward pressure on wages and compensation. Uh, Robert King, director of research at the Jeremy Levy uh, Forecasting Center said. So when you start looking at this, in the last two quarters, U.S. businesses has po- have posted its widest profit margin since 1950. But as buyers slow, as prices really start to ebb, then you're seeing how do you pass on more cost as your costs still remain elevated. And that's when you start looking at are we how far are we into the late cycle move? And that's when you start looking at the business cycle and how we start to see some of these slowdowns. And the margin leading indicators is showing that we're going to see that pressure on the on margin. And I think it's going to be very interesting to see how quickly this happens and how investors react. You know, is this what drives institutional investors to sell and then retail investors follow? This is where you're going to see some of this conflict between how the Fed reacts and what and now are investors going to be proactive or are they gonna, or is the Fed gonna move and investors investors are gonna react? Because typically the Fed has been very reactive. So as things get priced in, they then do it. But right now you're not you're not seeing much priced in. And that's where we could get some of these bigger uh, market moves. And then the manufacturing PMI seasonally adjustment, you know, this is where, again, new order inventory is coming down. And that's the prices paid starting to flatline. But you've seen them pause before. And even, but you can still see prices paid remain elevated, which is where we see some of the sticking point where new orders, inventory is coming down, but prices paid remaining elevated, which again is that push me, pull me side of things. And then just putting it into perspective, the largest, the 10 largest global equity inflows ever through November and largest year-to-date globally equity inflows by year. So you can see where 2021 is, 2.5 times larger than in 2013. Again, just showing how levered many of these retail investors are. But what does that mean for real GDP? Because the output cap is starting to close. And there's some indications that that is closing faster as productivity kicks up and, and after seeing a huge drop which you start to see that close a bit and you start to see a bit more of a normalizing factor. Household survey showed stronger returns to work versus the payroll survey. We, as we said on Friday, we think it's somewhere in the middle. And then when you start looking at, well, where are we seeing some of these changes? And you're seeing leisure and hospitality flatline, local government coming down, which is seasonally normal. Retail trade manufacturing is where we're seeing some of this, this flatlining. And remember from the very beginning of 2020, uh, 2021, we expected a check mark where we were going to have 50 people, uh, say just using round numbers. So 100 people were at a, a company. You know, they went from 100 and they were going to drop down 50. And then out of that 50, 25, we're going to come back quickly. But then the other 25, we're going to take much longer. And five of the 25, we're never going to come back. And we're seeing that play out now. And I think this is where some of that stickiness is in terms of the slack in in just employment is going to become a bit more overwhelming. And you're starting to see that here where jobs openings reversed higher in October uh, to 11 million versus the estimate of 10.5 million and 10.6 million in the previous month, but quit rates ticked down. So now you're starting to see, well, maybe I shouldn't quit my job. Maybe, you know, what I thought was over there isn't as good. And you're starting to get some of this pause. And again, it just could be a pause and we go back up, but this is showing some signs, but it's also seasonal. How many people quit their jobs in December? Now you're going to wait for your bonus. And then after your bonus is paid out. So that's why January and February are going to be important months to see what kind of mobility we see. But then also relative wage risk. And this is wage risks, heaviest in retail services industry, lowest in utility. Uh, te- so 
Where is energy? Oil and gas and consumable fuels, there's relative wage risk is shrunken because, but at the same time, you still are struggling to fill wages. So I think that some of the bottom side, you could see um, some risk up as you start to see some of that top side slow down and you see some of that pivot and you get uh, something a bit more balanced in terms of risk on, on price increases. U.S. labor productivity output per hour um, ticked down, and it was a weaker picture in third on third quarter than initial reported. Productivity came in at negative 5.2% versus the initial 5%, worst rate since 1960, and unit labor cost was at 9.6% versus the initial 8.3%. So you're seeing things get a bit worse, but again, we expect that to adjust and get a bit better through Q4. And all the while, U.S. average hourly earnings have continued to improve. But then when, as we've talked about, when you adjust that for real wages and inflation, it actually gets a bit weaker and closer and just below the trend line. And the increasing prices is the most common way to deal with supply problems. But as the supply chain starts to get a bit better, and again, this is more of a Q2, uh, Q2 Q3 2022 comment, where are wages? Are we going to see some of these prices that that are being passed through for the man, for the service for the supply chain now going to wages and wages getting a bit better? And again, this is coming back to the stickiness where increases in sale prices, service businesses substantial, service businesses somewhat so almost forty percent are seeing increases on the manufacturing side, almost seventy percent. Substantial is about 25% and somewhat substantial is upwards of about 45%. So you're seeing a serious increase in prices that is not going away anytime soon. So again, this is more to the, our point on inflation into stagflation and not really of the deflationary cycle. Revolving credit is starting to tick up as we continue to talk about for the consumer, even though wages are continuing to move up for the higher wage, uh, for the lower wage workers, lower wage workers continuing to go up, all workers flatlining down slightly in, in November. And it's because when you look at higher wage earners, they're continuing to come under pressure. And those are the individuals with the discretionary cash, which again is going to slow down some of that activity, which is why when you look at household income and total hardship, 71% of people talked about hardship when you look at uh, the lower income, even though wages are going up, they're seeing a 71% are seeing some sort of hardship that is hitting. So latest poll from Gallup shows that 45% of U.S. adults are experiencing some kind of financial hardship due to inflation. 10% are experiencing severe, while 54% are not struggling with higher prices. And it comes down to household income. Because that's when you start looking at 50% or more in the four, in the middle to low income levels are seeing pressure points, even though wages are going up, which again speaks to pressure on the underlying spending and consumer in general. And that's when you start looking at holiday shopping. 2019, you get a normal kind of spike up. And this is looking at debit card transactions at department electronic stores around Thanksgiving. People are opting more for online and you're just not seeing the same type of activity. Uh, and, and this is playing out spending just, uh, just below 2019. As we were talking about, some of that spending was pulled forward and less activity on that, uh, good, on that Black Friday. So two two key indicators of possible inflation risk are moving higher in the U.S. U.S. jobs switcher pay premium and quits, which again is showing how that wage pressure is going to be supportive of that sticky inflation. And then when we look at the share of compensation, it's more stock-based and less salary as you have tech being some of that key driver, again, providing some of those those, uh, benefits to the upside. And then Chase Consumer Card Spending Tracker, here you can see spending uh, over two years still remains strong, and we've seen that give way. We just think that it slows significantly in December and as we go into the beginning of 2022. Now, in the next segment, we're going to look at U.S. jobs data and other leading indicators.